Good evening, everyone. This on? There we go. My name is Diane LeBlanc, and I'm the Regional Administrator for the National Archives Northeast Region, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to our second a public meeting of the day. The first we had it at 10.30 this morning, um, and that was uh, very informative. It was, it was a great group. We, we had a full house, in fact, um, and, and at least one person liked it so much he came back tonight. <laughs> um, the, the food was good this morning, and, it, and it's good this evening as, as, as well. Uh, but I really, I mean, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. This is an important time, and, and we need to hear from you with regard to your thoughts about our upcoming move. Um, I want to introduce uh, some of the National Archives staff who are here. Tom Mills, the Assistant uh, Archivist for the Office of Regional Record Services. Dave Powers, the Assistant Regional Administrator. Nancy Shader, the Director of Archival Operations. Dorothy Doherty, who is our Public Program Specialist. Now we also have several other NARA staff members and volunteers, so if you could just wave. And uh, they will introduce themselves when we sort of go around the room. And I'm gonna turn this over to, to the boss very, very quickly, Mr. Tom Mills, but just a little bit more about Tom. Uh, he's been with the National Archives. Where is he? Behind me? Oh, sit down. He's been with the National Archives for 10 years, um, nine years in his current position as the boss, uh, as our boss, reporting directly to the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Um, his first year with the National Archives, he served as the regional administrator in the Mid-Atlantic region. But prior to that, he did 21 years with the New York State Archives. And um, he is a native New Yorker from Long Island. And, and again, I'm going to turn it over to him, and he'll tell you a little bit more. Thank you, Diane. And thank you again, everybody, for uh, coming this evening. Um, we're we're going to have a, a, a meeting tonight to hear from you. So you're not going to hear a tremendous amount of us talking at you because this is all about hearing from uh, you. There, there's a relatively small number of uh, uh, attendees tonight compared to uh, this morning, but we didn't know. Um, so, uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, everybody's comments are, are valuable and welcomed. Also wanna say that this is the beginning of the process of having a dialogue with our customers, uh, users, stakeholders um, about our move, which is um, going to occur about 18 months out from now. So we're at a point in the process where we, uh, we definitely need uh, advice and feedback from those who are going to be using this facility after we move. Um, I did want to say also that, uh, um, as Diane said, um, I'm originally from New York. There are several people here I know. Steve, Peter, uh, Roger have worked with in the past. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, we'll look forward to working with you uh, in the future. Um, th this, uh, as I said, is a process where we're gathering information, and as part of the process, we are uh, video recording the proceedings, and we will be also uh, making uh, the, available via the internet all the information that we've been gathering in the two meetings today, along with um, any responses that are appropriate from the National Archives. We don't view the discussion, at, and we did in this morning, as archive staff engaging in a debate about issues. Um, that, that's not what these meetings are about. They're about gathering information and then having an ongoing dialogue. So this is not a debate setting. So we want you to just you know, express your interests con and concerns um, to help us build a better plan. That's what it's all about. In order to um, uh, have a, a, a good record of the proceedings, um, what we'd like to do to begin is ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves um, for the record. 
Um, and if you would tell us your name, your affiliation, and a little bit about um, what your interest is in uh, the National Archives here in New York. And I'll start with my friend, Maria. I'm Maria Burks with the National Park Service. We are, my offices are up at Federal Hall. We have a number of sites around Manhattan. And uh, we've been working in partnership with the National Archives now for several years, talking about joint programming and jointly managing the public facility that we have in Federal Hall. So I'm really here just interested to hear what the community has to say about the archives um, materials that, you, that the archives has and manages. So we could be thinking about that in the context of the new program and facility at Federal Hall. Uh, hello, nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Gushman. I've been with uh, the archival staff here in New York for about five years. And then this week, as a matter of fact, I just moved over into the records management side of the office. And I'll be working more with other federal agencies in the region on their records, uh, whether they end up you know, becoming, coming into the National Archives or not. And then, of course, working with the archival staff here that I know very well um, on the records that do come into the National Archives. I'm Kevin Riley. I've been a volunteer here on Saturday since uh, 2007. I'm currently a student at the Palmer School in New York City. I'm Angela Tadiko. I've been an archives technician here for a year and a half. Hello, I'm Bonnie Marie Sauer. I am an archivist with the National Archives for about two years now. Uh, my name is Greg Plunges. I'm an archivist at the uh, office, too. I've been with the National Archives 23 years. Jennifer Nelson, Director of Archival Programs, uh, Headquarters, National Archives. Christopher Zarr, Education Specialist for the National Archives at New York City. My name is Steve Siegel. I am a professional archivist and professional genealogical researcher. So I've been an occasional user of the National Archives over the years, and I've made acquaintance with many of the professional staff in various professional meetings over the past 31 years. My name is Peter Walsh, and I direct the Archives and Public History Program, which is a graduate education program at New York University. And we've done a lot of work with the National Archives over the past uh, 16 years that I've been involved with the program. Uh, in terms of hosting classes, in terms of working out internship programs and things of that sort, um, and also an occasional researcher as well. Gee, Tom, you didn't make us stand up this morning. <laughs> I'm Roger jo <laughs> I'm Roger Jocelyn. I'm a certified and forensic genealogist, and I came for the food since I didn't get any this morning. Um, my experience with the archives began about the mid-70s, starting up in Waltham and soon got a taste of Archives 1 and down in D.C., and I've been a, a, a very uh, long-term and certainly favorable user of this wonderful resource in my work, um, both professionally and, you know, for my own personal use. <laughs> my name is Eleanor King. I'm the archivist at the Police Athletic League. I have been a faithful reader of the monthly newsletter from the New York Office of the Archives, and I really appreciate all of the information that's contained. Unfortunately, I never get a chance to take advantage of the lunchtime meetings and stuff, because my life doesn't allow that. Too many hats, too little time. But um, I really just wanted to know what changes were occurring. And I was recently at a wonderful experience up at the New York City, the, sorry, the Museum in the City of New York, and saw some documents from the National Archives that were used in a discussion. Brian Anderson, who's the Commissioner of Records, was there with Pete Hamill and Dominic Chianese, and they did a, a really interesting experience. And so it was, it, uh, it made me even more so want to come tonight and hear what's here, what, what's going to change, and what we can do to help. Hi, uh, my name is V. Chapman Smith. I'm the regional administrator for uh, the National Archives Mid Atlantic Operation. I formerly was state archivist for the state of New York, so I know quite a few of you guys here work with you on different advisory groups or have seen you as part of that program. And so I'm here to 
talk about how Philadelphia will be supporting New York uh, going forward with the transition to the Customs House. Uh, Patrick Connolly, archivist of the National Archives in New York, and I've been with uh, NARA for 10 years now. And may we impose on you to introduce yourself? My name is Carmen Adames Rivera. I am a user of the archives at Barrett Street. I was here recently because my grandchildren were studying the American Indian. So I was here for, during Easter week. One was from DC and one was from upstate. We're in D.C. area. Washington, D.C., but it's funny because we were at the archives first, not knowing that they were moving here. We did some work at the archives in, at Barrett, and then we came here and we saw the exhibit. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. In order to uh, make sure everybody has the same kind of context uh, about uh, the, the move from Barrack Street to uh, the Customs House here. Um, the staff from the Northeast Region and the National Archives in New York City, Dave Powers, Nancy Shader, and Dorothy Darty, are each going to give a couple minutes of introduction from their perspective um, about the um, plans for the move. So I'll start with you, Dave. Great, Tom. Thank you, and good evening, everybody, and thanks again for taking the time to come down to the first public meeting. We hope there'll be several others as we move forward during this uh, 18 to 24 month transition. It's been quite a process uh, to get to this point uh, to this evening. Going back about five years ago was when the first time GSA approached NARA about uh, possibly relocating from Varick Street to the Custom House. Uh, we've made our visit down here and obviously just absolutely ecstatic about the building, the location, partnerships with the Federal Hall and Ellis Island that were already in place. So the setting, the location, everything was absolutely ideal. The problem was the space was just insufficient for our operations at that time. So as much as we hated to, we had a pass in 2005 and then commenced a market survey of every other space in GSA's inventory uh, throughout New York, New Jersey, but all over Manhattan. So by 2007, uh, some of us came down to celebrate the 100th year uh, of the Custom House. And shortly thereafter, after admiring all the restoration and beautiful work that GSA had done here, uh, they came calling a second time. And this time, they now had space on the third floor where we're currently sitting and on the fourth floor besides uh, a dedicated education room, which would be adjacent to the auditorium. So besides the additional space, they also came with some substantial financial incentives. First, they would contribute uh, close to a million dollars in capital improvements for the project, and also provided substantial rent reductions over the first five years of what's noted as an, an occupancy agreement. So now, as you might imagine, we're extremely interested. Uh, a series of discussions with NARA, GSA, and others resulted in an independent study by an architectural and engineering firm that was finished just about this time a year ago. And the main thing that we were looking for was, can you protect and preserve our records at this location? This is something that we can't do at Varick Street pursuant to NARA's strict uh, standards for archival storage. So the results were very positive. They guaranteed that this is something that could be done here. We could never achieve that at Varick Street. So besides preserving our records, additional space, an ideal location, financial terms, it was really time to uh, make a decision and move this thing forward. So last July, uh, the acting archivist came up for a visit listened to our recommendations, read Tom's memo with all of our support, and uh, shortly thereafter, we signed an occupancy agreement for the space here at the Customs House. So with that occupancy agreement is a schedule of projected timelines. And um, as Tom indicated, we're looking at 18 to 24 months. But the guideline for occupancy that they listed was August, September of 2011. 
So where we stand as of this moment, uh, we're waiting for GSA to sign a contract for the design work, which will have layouts, drawings, et cetera, that we plan on making available to all of you. Throughout the summer, this process will take place. So let's say by the end of the summer, we're looking to make those drawings available, get some additional comment and review from everybody so that this space, when we're ready to go to construction, we have the type of consensus that we're looking forward to make this just the absolute best place uh, for all of us uh, in New York City. So I think I used my three minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Now the director of uh, archival operations at the National Archives in New York, Nancy Shader. Hello. Um, we're very excited about the move to the Custom House. Uh, Dave touched on this, but our current space does not meet our storage standards, meaning we can't maintain a consistent temperature and humidity level, and that speeds the deterioration of record. Coming here to the Custom House, we're gonna be able to design and build storage facility that will meet those standards, which extends the life of the records. Um, everyone here has pretty much been to Varick Street, so you're familiar with the facility, and perhaps it's less than friendly interface coming in, uh, security is becoming more and more strict based on several factors including the fact that there's an immigration detention center on site. There are several law enforcement agency tenants, so the line to get in the building is getting longer and longer because the screening process is becoming more intense. So that process is taking more time, it's not the most friendly welcoming, and they're starting to ask people for ID, asking if you have appointments. So it's making the process of research, which can be intimidating to some people, even more so. Here at the Custom House, security is run by the Smithsonian. They're happy to see people who are not scheduled to be here. They're familiar with working with large groups, with casual visitors. It's welcoming, and we think it will help encourage people to come to us, and perhaps encourage people who wouldn't normally visit an archive to come visit us at the National Archives at this location. And that's something I think we should all remember. We're all comfortable going to an archive or to a research library, but many people aren't. And we're, we believe, they think you have to be an expert, that you have to be a, an attorney, you have to be a legal scholar, you have to be a, a professional historian or professional genealogist to do research, and that's not the case. We have the people's records, and we want the people to have access to those records, and we believe this location is ideal for us to reach a wider audience. Now, something that many people may not be aware of is we currently store over 50% of our records off-site, and we provide seamless access to those records. We work with our patrons, we identify what they need, and we have it available when they need it, and we're committed to continuing to do this. We've had a large portion of our records off-site. It's going to be five years in September, and we've been able to maintain our high customer service standards, and we plan to continue to do that. So that's important. We've worked on a preliminary list of records we'd like to take with us to the Custom House. This list was compiled by staff based on staff experience working with researchers. It is a preliminary list. We're going to be making it available to the larger community for feedback, and our goal here is to identify the best possible combination of records and microfilm to have on site to reach the widest audience. So we do encourage feedback on that list because it will be a process. But something I want to point out is even when we've made the decision, even after we've moved, if we've determined we should have taken something that we didn't, we can bring it back. And we do that already. We have records stored off-site, and if we've sent it off-site and we determine it should be back, we bring it back. So we have mechanisms in place to do that. And we see this as being very flexible, that if we do determine a different record is being used in a way not anticipated five years from now, we can bring that to the Customs House and make that available to researchers. So, Basically, we're excited because we believe it'll be good for the records, good storage facility, good for the public, more welcoming an environment, and better for the National Archives. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, when uh, Nancy referred to off-site storage, right now we're storing records in uh, off-site in Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, a new off-site storage location will be closer in Northeast Philadelphia which is part of the Mid-Atlantic region, which um, V administers. So I just want to make sure you're all aware of that fact. Uh, and finally, uh, Dorothy Darty, who's the uh, head of public and educational programs here for the New York National Archives. Great. 
Thank you all for coming. Um, just to play upon what we've already discussed, you know, we do want to reach a wider audience, and that's where programs really is important. Um, like Nancy said, many people don't know the National Archives exists here in New York. They don't even know that the National Archives um, is a repository for their records. So we're here to serve the public, and one way we can educate the public about what we have is through our programs. But I would emphasize that the push in our programs is really to get people in the door and then get them into the research room because we want them to explore the records and we want to increase our visitation in the research uh, environment. Um, if you've looked at our numbers, if you look at the fact sheet we handed out, our numbers are down in terms of researcher visitation. And one way we can address that is by increasing programs. Uh, you've heard um, us mention some of the programs we have. We, we do programs currently for educators. We do teacher professional development sessions. We do student field trips. Uh, we do a number of genealogical sessions. Most of those are by request. Um, from various organizations, but we also do a genie series called Finding Family, and those are the core programs that we currently do at the National Archives in New York City, uh, but here we'll be able to expand those programs greatly. Uh, Dave mentioned we will have dedicated space here, so the space will actually be designed to our specifications, to our needs, and to our patrons' needs. Uh, the nice thing about the space here is it will be increased quite significantly, not just for programming, but for research, uh, uh, for the research room. And so we'll also have dedicated public access computers that people can use and follow along as we do our training sessions. And that's been a request that the public has made over the years. They want to participate with more hands-on programming, and this space will provide that. So uh, we're very excited about that aspect of the move here. Uh, in addition to that, we will have some shared space with the, the, with the building um, through GSA and through the other tenants. We can utilize the rotunda, and we expect to have some traveling exhibits here that will showcase the holdings of the National Archives. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we will also be able to have some shared space in the, the basement with the auditorium. And that means we can increase our programming to reach a much larger audience that we currently could reach at Varick Street. Um, several of you have attended our 75th anniversary event. Um, we've had briefings in the past where we've had crowds of over 100, uh, but we couldn't accommodate those people in our current space at Varick. So we had to have those programs at off-site uh, repositories and partner with other organizations. But here we will be able to have those type of programming uh, programs um, without without having to, to worry about having an off-site space. Um, and we can invite our partners to utilize our space as well. So we're very excited about that. Okay. Thanks, so I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Diane. And if you have any comments or questions, she'll hand you the microphone. <laughs> How did I know to walk this way? <laughs> Well, I have a little advantage because I was here this morning and heard the comments and so forth. Uh, just a couple things to pass on. Um, I ran into a couple of people who were here this morning, and uh, unfortunately, they're very pessimistic. They said they're just putting a face on it. They're going to do what they want anyhow. So if you want to take that as you have your work cut out for you, I guess that's what it would be. Um, but there was a lot of concentration on the list, only a few of people who were here and maybe even now who have seen this, there was some discussion of it. And I was thinking <clears throat> when I sat with Dorothy for I guess over an hour last week and we looked at the list and as I and Jordan who was here this morning expressed great surprise of the wonderful, you know, juicy things that even maybe not fall into what we do for our clients but just fascinating things uh, that, that we weren't even aware of. Um, were there, <clears throat> I was thinking, as I was telling Dorothy, well, why I had certain favorite things that I was seeing on the list to be donated or that go to storage or whatever, and explaining why. I think in reverse, it would be good for the archives to be able to explain why they think a particular microfilm series or textual record series should go. Um, it's hard to know whether you have a group of financial historians that are coming in 
eagerly on a regular basis so you could justify having XYZ collections. And of course, there's a lot of things that you have that cross over with social historians, biographers, people doing research for uh, even movies, you know, for film background, things like that. So, um, you know, I'm not saying an essay on each one, but it seems to me it would be, un I think it would be helpful for us who want ABC so badly that if you can say why you think XYZ should go, um, that, that, that could be very helpful in the process. Who's next? Here we go, Stephen. A bit of a question, not to be answered now, but perhaps a brief response. For, for many of the agency record groups, there are comparable groups in the other regional archives. Mm -hmm. not, every, not every record group, but for many, you have for the local area what the other groups have. To what extent in this planning process of selecting records for retention here or moving to offsite storage, to what extent have you consulted seriously with all the, the other branches to get a sense how for the same record group those records are used in their branches uh, where there's relevant data? Uh, and perhaps a brief response on that one uh, would be helpful. I've spoken, um, my position, the regional archives directors, we have an annual conference and we often talk about records that are used and, and we're often very similar. So a lot of the records we have selected that staff selected are the records that when I've talked to other directors have said yes, we would take that. Now in some regions it's very unique. For example, um, I don't have a lot of Bureau of Indian Affair records. So that is not a heavy use record for me, but in other regions it's an incredibly high use record. So some are unique to the geography of that region, but the general of what we're selecting are the high use, the naturalization records, the docket books to help you get into the court records, you know, uh, select historic site records that document a particularly important location, for example, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, things like that, Navy Yard records in other, like Philadelphia is a good example. So there is overlap. So we have talked to them and I plan on bringing them in throughout the process to hear what kind of feedback they have. Sure. <laughs> well, just a quick question. When you're talking about offsite storage, I assume that you're bringing stuff um, that, based on researcher um, requests, that stuff is going to be back in a reasonable amount of time, right? Like you send something offsite, somebody requested it. What do you anticipate is your normal turnaround for, or how far in advance would a researcher have to request records in order for them to be brought back uh, from offsite? We're working on that, um, but we are, since it is, as Tom noted, so much closer than the Kansas, we're looking into having a courier service back and forth. Um, whether it's once a week or twice a week, it's going to depend on use. We're also looking into, if you know exactly what you want, mm -hmm. doing what our record centers do, which is digitize on demand, and we can get it to you same day. So if you want something very specific and we can quickly identify it, we could get it to you same day. If it's you want to look at five boxes of this particular Situ you know, court case or correspondence, we would arrange that with you. Our, the challenge here, and this is for Dorothy as well, is to educate our users, to help them understand, contact us first via email, telephone call, just so we can make sure when you come, we can make your time with us as productive as possible. So that's gonna be a challenge, and that's something we're working on now is, we've surveyed other institutions, what their turnaround time is, and we're working on that to see what's the best combination. For yeah, and I would just say, I mean, from my own perspective, it's. A, I think if you're a researcher, you're pretty much used to stuff being in offsite storage now. I mean, at NYU, for example, we have a tremendous volume, a tremendous percentage of our archival collections are really are offsite. Uh, they have a facility, one in New York and one in Westchester County, and that's, I mean, I think virtually every research institution that has kind of large collections of bureaucratic records is kind of moving in that direction, especially if they're in urban areas where the cost of, obviously, you know, space is so at a premium. So I don't think it'll be any a surprise to people, but I do agree that, you know, good education uh, really is important. And in our case, actually, interestingly enough, uh, the library is moving a substantial percentage of its books off-site. Um, so, I mean, they're even going beyond just archival collections and more into books. And, you know, it's, I mean, I think it's just the way things are, and I think the research community kind of adapts to it. So it doesn't, I don't find that particularly troublesome, personally, and I, I doubt uh, many of my colleagues at NYU would either, so. Related question. For records that have been already shipped to Kansas, but have been perhaps requested more frequently than others, are you considering then transferring those to the new Philadelphia facility? 
in order to speed up the process of service? Yeah, we're looking at the, all the records. And, and in fact, as I mentioned before, we have had some records that were requested and we said to ourselves, why did we send that offsite? We already brought it back to New York and that's gonna come with us here. So it's definitely, we're looking at the big picture and in use. Um, the records that are currently stored offsite are fairly easily retrieved and we have good intellectual control over it. Stuff currently at Varick, we're working very hard to process to get better intellectual control, which is helping us identify them. So during that process, that may make some of the records we have on site even more useful. So again, flexibility is the key. As people use it, as we identify different resources, we may shift what's where and, and we are prepared to do that. We fully expect to do that. We don't think the decisions we make now are necessarily gonna be what it's going to look like five years from now. Any additional questions? On a different subject. <laughs> you met, in terms of public programming, could you give us a sense, for some of us who are involved in other historical and genealogical organizations where we've, we've been to small scale programs in the Barrack Street facility, what's the scope of the public event facilities that you will have or have access to um, when things are all finally settled? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we certainly want to continue the programs that we do now because they've been very successful and we want to expand them. Um, we've had a number of requests for additional student programs and additional teacher programs and hence the reason why we have a dedicated educator now on staff. Uh, Chris has been with us almost two years and he's, being, he's available to accommodate those additional requests. Uh, but one of the comments I've heard often is how can you do more general events, general outreach to the main, you know, population who's not experienced with research. And um, we really see us expanding maybe archives week programs, archive month programming. Um, we certainly see the opportunity to do special events related to historic uh, anniversaries. Um, there are a number of partnerships we work on with Federal Hall, National Memorial, um, and Ellis Island. And ha just having the space here will allow us to really plan for bigger programming. Um, and this is where the archival staff will provide feedback and provide input. We're all in this together, so we're all going to support each other. And when we have those larger events, even though we currently have a staff of two people, everyone in the archives will assist. Um, because we all benefit back and forth programs, increasing visitation to the research room and vice versa. So we see them, that, that aspect of the archives really uh, working well together. My Does that answer your was, question? Yeah. You, meant, you referred several times to the auditorium. Mm -hmm. What is the capacity? What will be the capacity for accommodating the public? How many people will uh, be? 300 plus in the auditorium. There are also two breakout rooms that adjoin the auditorium, and um, we should probably have a private conversation about this, Steve, to talk about maybe increasing some kind of genealogical event um, here in Manhattan, because I know, uh, was it three or four years ago, the Family History Fair um, kind of stopped and um, I was mentioning to Roger, we would like to bring that back and work with the various entities to bring that back. So that's just one example of something we've identified. Um, and certainly if the public come back to us and say, we'd like to see this too, if we can do it, we will. Since Peter brought up the subject of retrieval from offsite storage being kind of a you know, a given and, and works well. Um, I just had this thought. I, 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 I believe it will and does for the National Archives. I must confess I haven't had experience with having to order too much that's off-site through NARA, but I have bad experiences with other facilities that have archives or at least off-site storage, shall we say, that are under different government agencies, maybe some even private. Is it something within your capacity, I would assume this would be under your hat, uh, Dorothy, that the, archive, the National Archives could um, sort of encourage or have programs or something that would help educate and train and so forth many of these other places that don't really have good archival and retrieval policies? I know it all comes down to the almighty daughter, dollar and things like that, but, um, you know, they're just, it's a nightmare with some of these, I'm sure, as you're well aware. But it, I'm sure it's something that the archives could spearhead, or maybe there have been 
events where this has done, and, and how do you browbeat some of these agencies to take advantage of learning and implementing? Uh, it's certainly something we can work on, Roger. I think that was a compliment in there. There you go. <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, Maria. <clears throat> Just a comment about retrieval from, uh, from remote storage. Um, when I was the superintendent at Cape Cod National Seashore, we had the archives come in and clean up our records, which were, uh, it's, it's embarrassing to, to say what bad condition they were in, stored in an attic and just a disaster. Um, but we were very fond of our records, and the fact that we could go upstairs to the attic and just get them whenever we wanted, you know, was a real advantage. So even though we needed the archives to clean them up, um, you know, it was a bitter pill to realize that we were going to have to let them go, and they were going to have to go to remote storage where they would be properly protected. It was the entire history of that park from the day it was created. So uh, we saw them go with, you know, despair that we would ever see them again. But I have to tell you that the service we had from the National Archives was excellent, A+. Plus. Um, we never waited more than about 48 hours for anything that we needed, and if it was something that was really urgent, things were FedExed, and I mean, I was just amazed at the service. And we never experienced the archives before, and, um, um, but I have to say, when I came here and realized we were gonna be working with them again, I was really happy. So just a testimonial from a satisfied customer. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? All right, well, I'm gonna turn the microphone back over to Tom Mills. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so uh, there were several comments uh, relating to the list. Could you like wave your notebook there? <laughs> so, uh, those of you who may not uh, fully understand that, um, only certain of the holdings are going, uh, both original textual records, as we refer to them, and microfilm, i.e. duplicate holdings, um, are being moved to the Customs House location. Um, and we are in the process now of working with staff and then volunteers and now um, some of our more frequent users to discuss this list and refine it. And one of the things I heard uh, as one of the comments is, would, maybe it was from you, Steve, be helpful to have uh, more annotation of, of that list to explain to people um, why decisions are being made. And I think that that's true for all of us. Or was that you, Roger? That was Ryan. Right. Roger and Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um, also wanted to uh, note that uh, the, uh, the, this, once the decisions are made, as Nancy said, you know, it, 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 will, be, it will be organic. There'll be, oh, it'll be, we will evolve this. Uh, relationship with our users, and we're always open to further discussion and refinement of what records are being stored there. And, and that leads me into two uh, kind of final comments I wanted to talk about. W one is that our uh, new archivist, still new, he hasn't been there a year yet, so I, uh, David Ferriero, who, you know, l learns a good portion of his trade here in uh, New York City, uh, at the New York Public Library. Uh, David is very interested in making uh, the best use and certainly better use than we have thus far at the National Archives of information technology. Um, so uh, part of what allows us to think about a new model of providing service to researchers um, uh, requires better use of information technology, such as scanning on demand that we've mentioned, building more of the partnerships with some of the uh, private sector and nonprofit sector um, uh, entities that are working in partnership with the National Archives to digitize massive quantities of our holdings, particularly records that are already microfilmed and records of high genealogical use. And we'll also be taking uh, much better advantage of the so-called uh, social media or Web 2.0 tools uh, that are available, we already are, uh, to communicate um, with, with, with researchers and with others interested in the National Archives. So there'll be a lot of changes coming in that area that are gonna help us develop, develop better programs and better, better access to our records 
no matter where they are. Um, and that is a segue to my uh, second point, that the vision um, we all share in the National Archives of having um, locations around the country that uh, ha uh, provide access to the National Archives are that each of those locations um, will ultimately serve as a portal for all of the resources of the National Archives. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that you can get every single record of the National Archives delivered to you um, within 48 hours, at least within the next five or 10 years or so. Um, but in the, as we think about the future and how we can use technology um, and what it means to provide access to records, our vision is that you know, anytime you step foot in a National Archives facility that you are being um, provided with, to the extent possible, access to all of the holdings and the expertise of the National Archives. Um, so technology, staff, holdings, it, together, um, that's what makes the national, is gonna make the National Archives uh, a great place to do research in the future. Um, and, and think about that, and especially for the genealogy community, um, you, you need to be aware that, especially in the last few years, we have been um, accessioning, acquiring legal custody of huge quantities of um, what, what we refer to as personal data series from other federal agencies. Uh, the first one being modern military personnel files, which are stored at our St. Louis location. Um, almost a half a million cubic feet already accessioned, um, representing, I don't know, five to 10 million files of uh, uh, American citizens uh, who served our country uh, since the late 1890s. Um, another series we're about to accession, Railroad Retirement Board files, which are now stored in our Chicago facility. Um, I expect within the next two or three months um, that those will be available through the National Archives. Um, immigration case files from the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, known euphemistically as the A files or alien files. Um, we recently concluded an agreement with USCIS to accession those files 100 years after the date of birth uh, of an individual who's a subject of a file. Um, personnel files of uh, civilians who work for the federal government. Again, millions of files. We're starting to uh, accession them, already have. Again, they're stored out in our St. Louis facility, which is the central repository for personnel files. In all cases, when we talk about this massive quantity of uh, personal data files, which are now over a million cubic feet of records already in our custody. Um, as we're working with the uh, agencies, we also obtain uh, uh, file or name level indexes to those records. And in some cases of some of the older records where the indexes don't exist, we're in the process of creating name indexes and we'll make them available on the internet. So it's easy to, easier to locate the information um, and order uh, uh, a file or information from the file um, as needed. So that there's a tremendous amount, I think, of energy and resources that are going into creating uh, kind of a, a, a new National Archives experience as we uh, look toward the future. Um, we want to serve our current researchers well, and we also want to bring in the vast majority, frankly, of Americans who are the ultimate owners of the National Archives but don't realize it. Uh, we want them to know, we want everybody to know that this is your National Archives. You're, you're welcome to come and use the National Archives for a whole variety of purposes, some of which may include simply coming to our public events, uh, viewing exhibits, um, and we want to reach out and do as many of them as possible with other partners, such as the Park Service, uh, and the genealogy community, like a genealogy fair, so that we can reach more and more people. Um, that's where we're headed, and uh, of course, we need your help and your support to do it. Um, this meeting is one step along that path, uh, and we expect to have uh, a lots more dialogue 
Um, somebody made the comment uh, that uh, perhaps this morning we said we were just putting a face on it. I can guarantee you that's not the case from my perspective. Um, we're going to listen to every single comment we get, and we're going to respond to all those comments, questions, concerns. Um, in some cases, we may agree to disagree, but we're going to listen, and we're going to take action to try and improve our services uh, as best you can and work closely with you. So, um, Thank you to the staff, all the staff who uh, stayed tonight to help. Appreciate it. And those of you uh, who turned out to give us comments, um, thank you also. Without you, we couldn't do it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.